Turn over your Bibles to John chapter 3. We get a run and start in John chapter 2, actually. You know, it helps to read your notes. You know. <laughs> you know, the title of the sermon today is Rise Again. And believe it or not, that's very apropos, because as I was walking in today, I, was, uh, I saw Jacob and Hannah standing at this door right here. And I, you know, I went away for a couple of days to, th to Louisiana for Thanksgiving. I was so fired up to see him and come back into town. I started to reach out to hug Jacob, and I didn't see that pipe. I tripped right over the pipe and fell flat on my face. I uh, busted my knuckle pretty good, and I got my shin real good right here. And you don't want to see the other side. It's worse. But <laughs> So in honor of that, the title of the sermon is Rise Again. Amen. Isn't it great to come back from the holidays? Yes. And get a little time with the family, and then come on back and get time with the family. Yes. Family never leaves, amen. In John chapter 2 and verse 12, the Bible says, After this he went down to Capernaum with his mother and brothers and his disciples. There he stayed for a few days. So Jesus also went away some time to get with his family. I don't know if it was Thanksgiving they celebrated, but I bet they were thankful. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found men selling cattle, sheep and doves, and others sitting at the tables exchanging money. Sounds normal, right? That's just what you do at the temple. At the temple? Found men selling sheep and doves and others sitting at the tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple area both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins, the money changers, and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a marketplace? His disciples remembered it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. You know, right here, I can just imagine Jesus walking to the temple going, I'm going to get some time with God, the house of prayer. I'm making some time in there. Oh, it's going to be glorious to remember all the great things of the past. And as he's walking in, he hears animals inside. He's like, well, they're supposed to be dead in there. He hears money clanging. People talking and yapping about this and about that. And who won the latest football game? Well, I don't know what they played back then. He walks in and he looks around and he sees all of this going on in his father's house. In the church, if you will, he sees people making money off of people who don't have a conviction. See, they were supposed to come to the temple with a ready sacrifice. They're supposed to pick their best and bring it. Go, this is for God. What else could I give to God? This is the best I've. If I only had something better, but God, this is this is the best I've got. But instead, they were too lazy. And they gotten accustomed to going in the temple. Ah, honey, we'll just buy it when we get there. We're running late anyway. And of course, the Pharisees saw an opportunity to make some cash. Oh, this is great. Hard-hearted people. I make more money this way. And Jesus grabs some cords as he's watching. I can just see him watching out of the corner of his eye. Just watching everything. Twisting those cords together. Just looking. I think it took a tremendous amount of self-control. Yeah. She's just like uncomfortable here. Wrapping another one around. And then another one. And then the thing's about six feet long. Just ties a knot in the end. Grits his teeth a little bit and probably just says a little prayer. God, help me not sin against him. But help me clean this thing out. And he starts whipping those cords getting the animals out of there. They're blown away. They see their Lord and like, oh my gosh, who is this guy? Why didn't we think of that? Why didn't we have the heart to do that? Where were we when we saw this happen our entire lives? Can we close that door in the back, please? Where were we? I can imagine the conviction they had, how they felt. We could have done that. We could have turned this thing around, but we didn't do it. Jesus runs them out of there, and they remember, it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. 
Jesus was consumed by zeal for his Father. When you're consumed by something, you don't have a lot of room for anything else. When you're consumed by something, it eats you up inside, but not like cancer that's tearing you down. It consumes you. It fueled him. It gave him energy. It gave him strength to do what he had to do. Taken from Psalm 69. They remember this. Not only did he have the zeal, he fulfilled what was expected of him as the Savior. Nobody would want a Savior to show up and go, oh, hi, guys. How's it going? Just hang out with you guys like everyone else and not make a difference. What the Savior was supposed to do was turn things upside down and get him to turn back to God. Are you zealous like Jesus? Now, I think Adrian was right. I think we've bypassed a large part of the turkey coma. You guys sounded awesome today. You guys just sounded zealous. But I stood over here and I was looking around. And I didn't make a whip of chords. Amen. But I noticed a lot of you weren't singing. I noticed a lot of you were looking kind of dapped down and, and not really thinking about what was going on. Some were distracted, kind of a, you know that blank stare? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> right in the middle of a song. So, uh, where were you? Where did you go? What was happening in your hearts? Maybe you got into some sin while you were hanging out with your family. Maybe an old girlfriend, an old boyfriend called you up while you were gone. Maybe you started thinking about the world again and some of the world slipped on into you as you were eating that extra piece of turkey you shouldn't have eaten. Anybody overeat on Thanksgiving? Thanks for being open. Amen. <laughs> but you know what it is? You get relaxed. How many of you guys watch football games on? Oh, man. Man. I love relaxing. I love being around family. We're in Louisiana where, I don't know, it's the most relaxed place in the history of the planet. I mean, anybody that talks like this, you got to understand they talk that way because they're too lazy to actually talk correctly. I grew up talking that way, so I, I can say it, you know what I mean? You say things like y'all instead of you all because you shorten it, you know, it's just quicker. Just get it done. But it was great being with my family. I got to have several uh, great deep talks. Um, we're going to be able to plant a church in Louisiana here very soon. <laughs> praying for my family, praying for the different relatives I have all over Louisiana. But did you get lulled into lukewarmness? Did some kind of sin or lack of heart take you out while you were gone? Would Jesus have to get a little whip and kind of wake you up a little bit. Are you with me here? Yeah. Or did you come back fired up and ready to go and ready to help whip a few other people into shape? Hopefully you came back ready, but if you didn't, today is the day to get your heart right. You ever been lulled into a sense of security? It's just false security. I remember when I was a kid, about 16, I lived in uh, Southern California, right close to the beach, and Every day after work, I'd go down to the beach, and I'd, I'd ride my boogie board. Yeah. Oh, baby. I'll tell you something. And one day, there were some extremely large waves, and I was so fired up. I was out there with a buddy, and we're just going for it. Two hours. I mean, I'm so tired, I can barely swim, but I don't care. I just catch one more wave. And finally, when we got into the shore, we're like, oh, man. Woo, that was awesome. I'm like, where's my stuff? Uh, we both looked at each other like, man, someone stole our stuff. And then we looked around and we're like, wait a second, where are we? And we looked and literally over a mile down the beach was where we started. We started a mile down the beach, but because the waves were coming in at a slight angle that day, without even knowing it, we got pulled right on down the beach. Because we weren't paying attention, we were too busy having fun and relaxing. See, Jesus came to make sure that you didn't get lulled into a sense of false security. Today, are you going to let Jesus consume your hearts? 
Let's go to chapter 3. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one can perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with them. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he's born again. How can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. Remember, he says this to a Pharisee right after he cleaned out the temple. I can imagine it's probable Nicodemus was one of the guys in the temple exchanging money or selling doves. And yet something struck him that day about Jesus. There's something about this guy. I'm going to sneak away. I don't want anyone to know, but I'm going to sneak away at night and get to know this guy. There's something going on. If you go back to chapter 2 and verse 19, Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. Jesus promises them that he will raise again. The Jews replied, it's taken 46 years to build this temple and you're going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scriptures and the words that Jesus had spoken. Right here, Jesus is trying to help Nicodemus get it. I have three points today. The spirit blows wherever it pleases. Earthly things versus heavenly things. And this is the verdict to prepare our hearts for communion. The Spirit blows wherever it pleases. Right here in verse 8, he says in chapter 3, you should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. And sadly, Nicodemus did not get it. How can this be, Nicodemus asked. Your Israel's teacher said, Jesus, and you don't understand these things? I tell you the truth. We speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. Point number one, the Spirit blows wherever it pleases. Jesus clears the temple. Nobody comes to him except one guy, and he sees that there's something in Jesus that he wants to get to know. He comes to Jesus at night, and and he gives him some lame comment. And Jesus says, hey, you can't see the king unless you're born again. Nicodemus is totally taken aback. What are you talking about? As if I need to be born again. I think if you might have heard between the lines, Jesus said, well, why did you come and see me? Why why do people go and see Jesus? What is it that we want from Jesus? What is it that you're looking for? Why are you here wasting two hours on a a Sunday afternoon? Unless you're here to make a change. He says, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. You know, sometimes you've got to explain things a little better, right? Sometimes you've got to dig a little deeper. You ever have someone tell you something and you go, I kind of get it, but can you explain it more? Yeah. So we've read this scripture a lot. We kind of know what it says, right? You've got to be born again. Duh. And yet I went ahead and did a little uh, background research. The word born in the Greek is genau, which means to procreate or regenerate. Again is anothen, which means from above. You've got to be born again from above. You've got to be born again and start over completely. Last week, we looked at Romans chapter 12. Turn with me there. He says in verse 1, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this war, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Doesn't that sound exciting? I don't know about you, but sometimes after a real cruddy day, I just go, man, if I could just think different. Can you just think different? You you ever been there? Oh, Oh, or you have a thought come in your mind. You're like driving down the road and the guy cuts in front of you. You just want to run into him real quick. Oh, am I the only one that thinks that? (laughs) You're no, 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 God, help me to be renewed in my mind right here. Not a good idea. Someone hurts you and you want to retaliate. No, God, please. I don't know about you, but I want my mind 
transformed. I want to be different. And we talked about how this is the gnosko or the gnos. This is what we know. What we know with certainty needs to be absolutely transformed. It cannot stay the same. Look in Titus chapter 3. Today, you and I need to make a decision to rise again. As you're turning there, I want to ask you something. How long does it take to change? How long does it take to change? One decision. That's it. I think Sarah read my notes. <laughs> it's interesting that Jesus went to the grave and it took him three days to rise again. You go, oh, they is a little slow right there. No, 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 no. The only reason I think it took him three days is because he needed to go do some preaching and to fulfill the scripture that said it would take three days. It didn't take Jesus that long. In the transfiguration, he changed in an instant. It's simply a decision to get yourself close to God. When you start getting close to God, when you start adopting his heart, you're going to start changing. Something's going to happen to you, even if you're not a Christian. I know many people that they're not Christians at all, and yet just because they read the word, something changes inside of them. They become a different person. It's like something starts changing in the way they think. They become kinder. They start thinking about other people all of a sudden. What is it? It's magical. It's amazing. This is the heart of God that he wants to get into us. In Titus chapter 3. And verse 3. It says that one time we too were foolish. <clears throat> what do you mean like yesterday? <laughs> Disobedient. Whoops, today. Deceived. Whoops, five minutes ago. And enslaved all kinds of passions and pleasures. Now he is talking about a person that became a disciple and there was a massive change. At one time you were like this. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, He saved us. So now we're not talking about disciples who are changing. We're talking about becoming a disciple. Are you with me? Yeah. Romans chapter 12 is written to those who are, are, not, are already disciples. They need to continue to change. Yeah. You want to stay saved? You want to stay in a saved relationship with the Lord? You've got to continue transforming in your mind. Yeah. You want to get saved? Some of you are visiting today. Some of you have been studying the Bible for quite some time. I want to challenge you today to stop wasting God's time. He's waiting on you to make a decision to make Jesus Lord of your life, and you stop being Lord of your life. Be honest with yourself. What's it gotten you this far? You're the Lord. You're the driver. You're the one making all decisions, and you've ruined your life, and you've messed things up, and your heart is empty. You need to make a decision today. There is but one Lord, and it's Jesus Christ. You need to take off the crown and let him be the Lord. Amen. And yet right here, he's talking about being saved in Titus. At one time, you were these things. You repented. You were born again. Verse 4, but when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, who, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior. So that, having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. Right here, Paul is helping Titus remember salvation. How he was saved, when he was saved. Right here, he's specifically referring to baptism and what happens when a person repents and gets baptized. He literally says, palagesania, which is a rebirth. And that word, internally in that word is the word poly, which means wrestling or to vibrate. Something literally had to wrestle and break free from who you were. Are you going to stay the same person? You have to be reborn. Plus in that word is anachinosis, which is renovation of mind and thinking. It's the renovation of what you know. Not only to be saved and to enter the kingdom, but to stay saved and remain in the kingdom, you and I have to be reborn again and again. We've got to start over. So this sermon is for those who are not yet saved. You need to become a disciple. You need to repent. You need to repent of false doctrine. Some people think false doctrine is not a sin. If you believe in false doctrine, if you believe in things that the Bible doesn't teach, and you hold those things in a religious way, you are lost. 
If you've adopted denominational teachings that don't line up with the Bible, you are not a disciple. I don't say that to hurt you. I'm trying to help you be free. If you don't know the scriptures, if you don't know God's plan of salvation, you are not a disciple. Again, I hope you came today to get changed, to rise again, and not just hear a warm, fuzzy sermon. If you're visiting, I want to challenge you. Have you really made a decision to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? Or are you giving lip service in some religious way? Or maybe you're just a pagan and you haven't really followed God at all. You too need to repent. You're here today. You're hearing the message. You will be judged for what you hear. That can either be good news or it can be bad news. It's bad news if you don't listen to what the Word says. It is really good news if you just listen. But it takes a tremendous humility to say, Jesus is Lord and not me. I've been inside for 30 years and it's still hard for me. I'm still as prideful as I was. It's just I've learned to overcome it a little better. It's challenging though. Have you repented, as the scriptures talk about, and been born again? Have you been baptized in water, as the scriptures talk about, and been born again? See, you're born of the water and the Spirit. If you're not born of the water, you haven't been converted in the way Jesus taught and his disciples taught. If you haven't been baptized for the forgiveness of your sins and then raised to a new life where the Holy Spirit can enter you, you have not become a disciple according to the scriptures. And let me tell you something right now. I don't care what your minister or priest or pastor says. The Bible says something different. The Bible says something very different. You must be born again, and Jesus says, of the water and the Spirit. At the same time, for those of us who are in the church, who are disciples, you've got to have a rebirth to be saved. Maybe today, you just need to flat start over. Maybe today, you realize that you've allowed hard-heartedness, lukewarmness, some kind of sin, somebody hurts you, some bitterness hits you, and you've pulled your heart back. If Jesus was sitting next to you, would he say, this is my brother, this is my sister, totally sold out? Or would he be concerned for you? Is he worried about how you're really doing? Disciples, let's be real. I've been around a long time, and I know how hard it is to stay faithful. The older among us will tell you, can't wait to get to heaven. Can't wait to get to heaven. Are you with me? Can't wait to get to heaven. I don't know exactly what we'll be doing, but it's going to be a little bit different than this. The battle is worth it, but are you willing to rise again? You know, what's interesting is, let's go back to John chapter 3. He says in verse 7, You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but cannot tell where it comes from, where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. You know, right here, i got to ask you something. Where is the Spirit blowing in your life? Interestingly, in Matthew chapter 4, Mark chapter 1, and Luke chapter 4, the Spirit, after Jesus was baptized, led him into the desert for 40 days. To be tempted. Where's the Spirit leading you? Do you want to go? Are you willing to go? The Spirit blows wherever He wants to go, guys. Where is He taking you right now? Where is He going to take you next year? Where is He going to take you five years from now? Are you willing to go? I'm talking geographically. But let's get down a little deeper and how about in your heart? Where's the Spirit trying to take you right now? Is He trying to help you get rid of something in your life that's a trap or an idol to you that you've held on to that's causing you to be separated from God and harden your heart? Is He telling you through people discipling you? Is He telling you through sermons, through situations at your job or school, you got to change this. I'm trying to save you. And yet you're resisting the Holy Spirit. See, it's painful to be born again. It's painful to be a place where you've got to rise again. You know, when I got up off of the concrete over there, I got up really fast, and Jacob's like, bro, are you okay? And of course, like, 
And on the inside, I'm like, that about killed me. <laughs> but on the outside, I'm like, bro, I'm fine, all good. I, I turned around and went, oh. <laughs> <laughs> it was painful, but I had to get up. It was time to go. Yeah. It is painful to change. Yeah. It's a little bit difficult. You might come out with a couple of bruises. You ever gotten hit by something? <laughs> That's going to leave a mark. Let me tell you something. Discipleship's going to leave a mark. The Lord's trying to save you. He's going to put you in situations. He's going to put people around you that you don't want. Sorry, Marcel. He's going to put situations in your life that are more difficult. You're like, this is impossible. I just can't handle it. And he's going to whisper in your ear, I got you. Just get up. I got you. I'm with you. Stop getting bitter. Get up. Rise again. Get going. You can do it. You know, over the weekend, I got to see, uh, once again, one of my favorite movies of all time, The Greatest Showman. I don't want to rehash it, but let me tell you, that is literally one of the greatest movies of all time. And, and right toward, you know, the end of the movie, when everything kind of falls apart, he just, he's just sitting there on the pile of ashes, and he remembers his dream. He remembers what he's there for. He remembers why he started the whole thing in the first place. Yes, he lost his way. Yes, he made huge mistakes. Yes, he sinned grossly and messed up. And yet when he remembered his dream, he got going again. What was it that kept Jesus going? He had an eternal dream that you and I could be saved. So he got up again. This afternoon, have you fallen down? He led Jesus to the desert. He led Peter to Jesus. G Peter had to transform and then had to take up his own cross. But he was crucified upside down. He led Paul to suffering. Thousands were saved. And then he led Paul to be beheaded. Yet he was faithful to the end. And all of these men were filled with zeal. Even after they messed up. Even after. They just got up again. Brothers and sisters, I believe many of us need to have a, make a decision. The Spirit blows wherever it pleases. I just need to rise again. You know, there's some changes coming in the church. Woo! You ready? You know, a couple months ago, we hired Isaac. What an amazing, transformed man. And then a couple months later, it wasn't enough. And we didn't have enough money. But we go, you know, we need some more people. And so we hired Marcel and Tia. Man, makes me want to hire like 10 more people. It makes me want to hire like 10 more people. See, the more people that are on staff, the more people that are full-time in the Lord, the more likely it is that you're going to be able to rise again, and you're going to help other people rise again. But the Spirit's blowing. And in the financial presentation, you hear more. Amen. You know, we need 10, 8 to 10 new Bible Talk leaders. Are you ready? We have a Bible Talk leader training program starting next Sunday. All of the Bible Talk leaders are going to go through it, and some of you who haven't even volunteered yet, we're going to tap you on the shoulder and say, listen, the church is growing. Guys, we started the year with 80 members. Now we have 110. I think we're going to get to 150 very quickly, and you cannot do what you got to do with a couple people on staff. How do you get more people on staff? You let the Spirit lead you to open your wallet. Guys, I got, one, I got one laugh and two amens. <laughs> now, I don't pay her, but my wife laughs at a lot of my jokes. But guys, seriously, the Spirit is leading us to be more generous. The entire month of December, we're going to study out the book, Money is the Answer for Everything. I want you to understand something. This is the smallest the church will ever be. It takes more staff 
more Bible talk leaders, more house church leaders, more money to do what we got to do. It takes more heart. It takes more faith. This is the smallest it's ever going to be. Wow. Are you with me? Yeah. I mean, who would be the next to put on staff? Some of you are thinking, me, me. No, you need to transform. <laughs> Amen? We'll, we'll get there. But if you're thinking it was you, you might be right, but you might be wrong. <laughs> you know, we, we, we need, we absolutely need to let the Spirit blow where He's going to blow. Amen? Amen? We also need one more individual to go to Atlanta. We need, a we need a brother to go to Atlanta. Now, I'm going to speak very freely, and if you're offended, I'm sorry. You can talk to me, but I've got to help you understand something about building a church. As we were looking at the Atlanta mission team, we realized that we had chosen far too many black, and, and, uh, black brothers and sisters. And Atlanta is an incredible place for the black community. It's an, a leadership mecca. If you want any leadership mecca, that, that's a great place. But what happened is the team got, got to be very uh, black. And I, I, I don't know about you, I kind of like black people, though. <laughs> and so after a lot of prayer and a lot of discussion, we had to make a very hard decision. And I, I, I had, we had to make a phone call to Hans and Charlene and say, listen, we want you guys to stay in Miami. <laughs> But I can't tell you who, but we've already talked to a sister to go to Atlanta, and she said yes. I need one more diverse brother to go to Atlanta. The Spirit's blowing. Are you willing to go? Point number two. Again, please understand, please understand. As you're building a church, if it's all of one race, you're going to become just like the world. Yes. At least in that aspect. I think they'll have all the same convictions. Are you with me? Yeah. But we've got to be smart. We've got to use a lot of wisdom in how we build churches. And we've got to be careful. If we continue here in John chapter 3 and verse 12, he continues, as I have spoken to you about earthly things, do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, and that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Right here we have the second point, earthly things versus heavenly things. I don't have time to get to all the scriptures, so I just want you to write these down. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 17. It's all about relationships. The number one relationship that can be very earthly is our relationship with God. Like, oh, bro, that's impossible. No, no, no. Your view and my view of God can be tainted by the world in two seconds flat. It's got to be a heavenly view of God. It's got to be a biblical view of God or you're not going to understand. You're not going to relate to him correctly. Your relationship's going to be ruined. If you think of God in a worldly or earthly manner, that's relationship number one. Relationship number two are the brothers and sisters. How easy is it for the world and earthly garbage to slip into a relationship between you and a brother and sister? I mean, isn't it weird? They hurt your feelings. They look at you funny, and you're like, like what? what just happened? This is my brother. This is my sister, and I'm so ticked off, I can't even think straight. You lay at bed at night. Mary, this ever happened to you guys? You're laying there, and you're and then he did this, and then he did that, and he did that, and then this is going to happen, and then after that, this is going to happen, and you know what I'm going to say to him? And none of that really happened. You're just letting it off. I know that never happens to you guys. It's because you're being earthly. You're thinking about people in a worldly manner. How was it that Jesus knew every sin, every piece of garbage thought you've ever had, and he still goes, my brother, my sister? Because he looked at you from a heavenly perspective. 
He goes, I know what you are today, but I'm thinking about what you're going to become. Amen. 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 You want to have great relationships? You have got to have a heavenly view of people. Someone hurts your feelings? So what? You're going to be in heaven with them. Someone lets you down? So what? Forgive them. You're going to be in heaven with them. Someone sins against you, and I'm not just a little bit, but grossly sins against you. And you know what? I'm going to forgive you right now on the spot. Why? Because I want to see you in heaven. Not only do I want you to go, I want to go. The Bible says if you don't love your brother who you can see, you cannot love God who you cannot see. If you're not in love with the brothers and sisters in this congregation and around the world, you can't go to heaven. It's just, it's just, it's part of the relationship with God. If you love God, he goes, you got to love my people. I mean, can you imagine being in heaven with people you don't like? I'm not going over there. Brother so-and-so lives over there. I'm not going to the North House Church because I don't like them. What? First of all, get to know O.J. and Jaleesa and you're going to like them. But that's not, like if you're thinking that way now, or if you're in competition with the campus, Oh, campus is growing. It's not fair. It's going to be fair in heaven. And maybe ask yourself, why is it your ministry growing? Are, are you with me here? Yeah. Guys, we've got to have a heavenly view of things. And the last one is money. Luke 16, 8, 8 to 15, just write it down. How you deal with money shows exactly who you are and what you believe. Can we talk frankly? Many members of the church do not give consistently on a weekly basis. Your relationship with God is in danger, and you're not thinking heavenly. You're trying to hold on to a couple of coins so you feel secure. Let me tell you something. Go to Venezuela and hold on to a few coins and tell me what you get. If you want to buy a loaf of bread right now, you need a stack of money about this high. And you want to hold on to a few dollars because you think it's going to save you or give you comfort? When people don't give consistently church, it's because you have a, an earthly view of things. You're not understanding what God's trying to teach you. You're not grateful and you don't trust him. If you're not given in a sacrificial way, You've got an earthly view of giving. You don't understand what you're doing, and the Lord is going to take away what you do have. He's going to bring heartache on you until you get it. Are you with me here? Very interesting, interestingly, disciples who hold back money that they promise to give to God go through tr tremendous struggles. And every single one that I've met over 30 years is doing terrible financially. Hmm. Disciples, I need you to hear me. We're here to build a church that's going to change the entire metropolitan area of Miami and Fort Lauderdale. As of the last couple of months, we are actually right around 7 million people. Two years ago, it was 6.7 million. Now it's closer to 7. 7 million people hanging the balance, and you're holding on to a few bucks because you don't trust God. Your relationship with Him is on the line. You're having an earthly view of things. And I just got to say it, many of you did not give at the special contribution. I, you know, you can do what you want. I, I, you know, as you can see, I can't make you do things. I can't force you to do something. But I got I to ask you, what was going on in your heart? You didn't give even anything. And some did not give all of their hearts. It, it hurts me. It hurts me. But today... It's about rising again. Today, it's about having an absolutely different view of these things. At the end of the service, we're going to do a financial presentation. It's not about the money. It's never about the money. It's about your dream. What do you stand for? What do you live for? What are you willing to die for? What are you doing what you do for? At the end of your days, it's all going to be summed up. What would you have lived for? What did you do all of this for? Was it earthly or was it heavenly? 
And finally, in John chapter 3, as we close out. In verse 19, it says, this is the verdict. You ever been in court? And you hear the gavel? Like, Ooh. This is the verdict. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. They had the heart to rise again. You know, I want to ask you, what is the verdict in your life? Is there any place in you this afternoon, any place in your heart, any place in your mind that you've reserved as a place that you don't give fully to the Lord, that you've pulled back, is there any place in your heart that you have loved darkness? Any place at all. Maybe it's with sexuality. Maybe it's your purity. You just, you're just not pure-hearted. Maybe you allow yourself to get worldly quickly and you don't do something about it. Maybe you're just, like talking about, hard-hearted about money and you don't trust the Lord. Is there any place in your heart where you've loved darkness? Remember we talked last week about opening that thing on up? There's something about just being totally open that just sets you free. Nicodemus wouldn't repent right here. And so Jesus says, this is the verdict. Lights come into the world, Nicodemus, and the problem with you, the reason you're not born again, the reason you're not changing, is because you're not willing to be open about what you've really done and who you really are. Now, joyfully, we find later that Nicodemus does become a disciple. Wow, what a hard heart, though. Does, do people have to have those kind of talks with you all the time? Last Sunday, I bared my soul as your leader, your church leader, as an evangelist, about my personal struggles with just loving the lost and evangelism and building strong relationships in the church, how I let things get in the way. I let fear of pain get in the way. I let fear of disappointment get in the way. I want to lead the way in being open, and I want you guys to follow suit. But it's not because I do it. It's because Jesus demands it. You know what's amazing about it? Once you repent, you get all that stuff out in the open, you confess it to the Lord, you confess it to other people, you're free. All of a sudden, you're not insecure anymore. All of a sudden, that, that wall of pride, that little arrogant, goofy thing that you do, it's all gone because you don't need to do it anymore because you've opened it all up. The Lord's healing your heart. The temptation to do those things is less and less. You're like, wow, this is awesome. I'm actually transforming. Today, I want to challenge you to be open, to really be open-hearted and let your heart be changed. You know, when we're going to take communion right now. So we're going to pray, but I want to ask you to think about what Jesus did. He gave up everything. He left heaven to be here with us. He was treated like dirt by people like me and you. He went to the cross willingly so that all of our sins can be forgiven so that not just he, but you can rise again. Right now, as we take communion, I want to ask you to make a decision. Decisions define you. So you've got to make a decision that Jesus is going to be Lord and that you're going to follow suit. He planned to rise again, and he did. Right now, as we take communion, I want you to do the same thing. I don't care if you tripped and fell flat on your face just like I did a few minutes ago. Get on up. Let's make sure Jesus is Lord. And let's take communion with a pure and righteous heart. Amen.